So what did we talk about last time? So last time we did. Last time we talked about quaternions a whole bunch more and kind of talked about the kinematics and you know how to get omegas into Qs, how to compose them, multiply all that good stuff. And I more or less just regurgitated that stuff with minimal derivation. I think you guys have probably seen that stuff somewhere else, a little bit, most of you, but otherwise, yeah. Um, if, you, if you have any question about that stuff, come talk to me, but um, everything was kind of in those notes. And we did kinetic energy of a rigid body. Yeah. Uh, something about and oh yeah, cool. Uh, there we go. Thank you. Are we good now? All right. Thanks. Cool. All right. So kinetic energy, and then we did inertia. And the version I wrote down is maybe a little different than the one you've seen before. Um, it's a little different than the standard one, but they're equivalent. Uh, and. Uh, Bonus points if you can uh, show the relationship between that and a covariance matrix. That's kind of fun. And let's see. Um, and then we did Euler's equation as kind of a straightforward um, sort of artifact of the you know the fact that we're writing this down in the body frame instead of the inertial frame, right? So in the inertial frame, it's just um, like derivative of angular momentum equals torque just like F equals MA, right? But in the body frame, you pick up this extra cross term and it's more convenient to write it in the body frame, it turns out. So that's kind of what we do. Okay, so today we're gonna kind of continue that discussion on um, Euler's equation that we, we were finishing up with last time. It kind of got cut off. Basically there, I wanted to get you this kind of fun little result on stability of spin axes for rotating rigid bodies, which is kind of classic result. Uh, so stability of spinning bodies, which shows up in a lot of fun little applications. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about numerical simulation of, uh, of 3D rotations, with particularly the, the couple of hints for the homework question two. Um, but that homework question two really kind of like, I think, does point out a bunch of the quirks. So I'm gonna give you a few hints for that and then kind of follow up there. Um, then we'll see how much time we have, but then we're gonna kind of talk about Newton-Euler dynamics um, and kind of the relationship there to SE3, this other kind of group theory thing that we mentioned last time. Okay, so let's get into it. And then hopefully, yeah, we'll see how this goes today and then kind of probably do one more lecture on this stuff and talk about some more applications. We'll do like quad rotors and airplanes and kind of talk about flying things, underwater things where this is a good, you know, basic dynamics model. Okay, cool. So first up, it's stability. Uh, and this is where we were just finishing up last time. And so, the first thing we, we did this last time, I'll just kind of restate it really quickly. So these bodies, um, if we assume that the angular momentum is constant, which is equivalent to saying that there's no torque on the body, right? So unforced. So this guy, constant. Um, we learn that this thing has six equilibria along the eigen vectors of the inertia matrix, right? Plus or minus the eigen axes. And these are kind of, we'll call these equilibrium spins. Um, and this, the idea here is, um, so equilibrium spin, um, so this isn't the same thing as the, the equilibria that we talked about last time or the full dynamics, you know, derivative equals zero. This, we're talking about equilibrium spin. What we mean by this is this guy, L dot or omega dot equals zero. So these guys, so we're talking about a constant spin, 
right? So the, the angular momentum vector or the angular velocity vector is staying fixed. That makes sense? Okay, so this means Euler's equation equals zero. We could write this a couple ways. We can do J omega dot in the body frame, which uh, equals minus omega cross J omega. This thing has to equal zero, right? And then when we did this last time, this implies then that omega cross J omega equals zero. And if we look at that, you know, kind of cross product-y thing, it means the cross product has to equal zero. If these guys are non-zero, it means that this guy has to be parallel to this guy, right? Yep. No, this is just this. You good there? So this, right, L, L in the body frame is just J omega in the body frame, right? And the derivative in the body frame, in the body frame, J is constant, right? So it's just this guy. Is that clear to everybody? So I'll make a note. So this guy is L dot B. Right, in the inertial frame, you pick up that extra term with the J dot, right? And that was kind of how we got away with this equation to begin with. But in the body frame, it's just this. Okay, so from last time, right? So this is true if omega b is parallel to j omega b. If I write this in a sort of suggestive way, it's j omega b equals lambda omega b, where this is a, a constant scalar, aka eigenvalue, right? That's sort of, the, this is the eigenvalue equation. So um, this just says that our, the equilibria are, are plus or minus eigenvectors of j. So cool, clear, right. Okay, so now what we're gonna do, so turns out we can always diagonalize J. In other words, J always has um, nice well-defined eigenvalues and an orthogonal eigenvector basis. Um, so we're gonna talk about something called principal axes of a rigid body. So. Basically here, um, we, I think we kind of talked about this before when we did inertia, but basically since kinetic energy has to be non-negative, uh, this J, what can we say about the J matrix? Yeah, symmetric positive definite. So, so we have this kind of relationship, right? So kinetic energy is this, and we have this is greater than zero for all omega not equal to zero. And so this, um, the definition, by definition, that means that J is strictly positive definite. Has everyone seen this notation before? It's a weird sort of scripty uh, greater than. In uh, LaTeX, this is SUCC. Uh, this is like, a, so what this, this just means J is symmetric positive definite. That means in other words, that J has all strictly positive real eigenvalues. Has everyone seen this? Has anyone not heard of this before? Cool, okay, good. So, So that's true, and therefore we can always diagonalize J into this sort of eigenbasis. And that's particularly nice 
for writing the dynamics down. Um, so this, um, this sort of eigenbasis for J, where we've uh, transformed it to be diagonal, it's called the principal axes of a rigid body or sometimes principal axes of inertia. As, who's heard of this before? Couple people. So this is sort of intuitively, typically these correspond to sort of the symmetry axes of the body, right? And these are the axes from Euler's equation, I think we just did. These are the axes about which the body will spin sort of cleanly in these equilibrium spins, right? Okay, so if we transform ourselves into this eigenbasis, aka principal axes, Euler's equation gets a lot simpler and we can actually write it down in components as just three equations. So here's what that looks like. So we're gonna write, um, instead of the B, we're gonna write a P frame for principal axes here. And remember this is diagonal. So these are just sort of the one, one elements. There's only three elements now, right? So all those cross terms are gonna go away. It's gonna look like this. And this is principal axes, right? Uh, oops. Gonna have to. Do this once and then you get the idea. So principle, principle, and then torque. And now I'm gonna leave off the uh, the P's and stuff. Is going to be okay. So now, right, to be super explicit about it, now the equilibria lie along these, um, these sort of basis vectors, right? And you can see that super clearly here because if everything's along omega three, say, these guys are all zero, this all drops out, the rest of these are all zero, right? And, and et cetera for, for each one of these, right? Okay, so any questions about this? Good. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna look at motion around each of these three axes for small perturbations. And we're gonna linearize these equations, assuming that, and look at the stability of each of these axes, all right? So in particular, we're gonna look at so let's do so first we'll do omega one. Oh, we're gonna assume also, sorry. We're going to just assume that the, the eigenvalues are ordered such that like the one one is the smallest, J22 is in the middle, 
J33 is the biggest for this. So now let's do, so we'll do omega one first. We'll say this is equal to some omega naught that's much bigger than omega two, omega three, right? So mostly spinning about omega one with maybe some small, you know, values, perturbations in the other two axes, right? So if we do that, if we plug that all into the, the top equation um, and sort of like, you know, linearize this, we get the following stuff. We get um, omega dot two is this omega naught times J three three minus J one one over J two two times omega three and omega dot three equals this omega naught times J one one minus J two two over J three three omega two. So right, I just wrote down the bottom two. The first one goes away because omega two, omega three are tiny, so it's tiny squared. So that's a that's not there to first order right in the first line. Whereas the second and third lines have omega one in them. And we're assuming omega one is this bigger value, omega naught, that's more or less constant. So those are linear in omega two and omega three, right? So the bottom two equations stick around. The first equation, the first order omega one dot is zero. Is that clear to everybody? So we're just doing a first order kind of Taylor expansion linearization of this thing. So we get the bottom two equations. The first one omega one dot is zero to first order. Okay, so what happens now, we're gonna call these things um, I should have moved this down a little bit. So we're going to call this coefficient on this equation, i.e. all this stuff in front of the omega three, we're going to call this alpha one. We're going to call this guy alpha two. Okay. So um, what are the signs of these guys? What's the sign of alpha one? Positive, yeah. How about alpha two? Negative. Negative, cool. All right, so I'm gonna write this down as a standard linear system now. So I've got omega two, omega three equals some matrix times omega two, omega three. And I've got in here alpha one, alpha two. So this looks like x dot equals a x. It looks like a simple harmonic oscillator, right? Looks like a standard simple harmonic oscillator and we know our stability stuff, right? We can just take the eigenvalues of this A matrix now. And it turns out like for two by two matrices, this is really trivial. And it turns out for this guy, it's just square root of alpha one, alpha two. So what, what can we say then about the eigenvalues here? So one of them is positive, one of them is negative. What's the product? Negative. So this thing, pure imaginary, right? Okay. So this turns out to be then what we call marginally stable for linear systems. And we said, you know, for nonlinear systems, you can't really uh, say anything about this. Um, I'll tell you right now, basically, turns out that this is Lyapunov stable, and you're going to get oscillations, bounded oscillations, and we'll see that in a, in a little bit. So that's cool. We'll just file that away. We'll do the next one now. Uh, so this guy, let's do now the, the intermediate axis. Uh, so this one is omega 2. We're going to call that this like big omega naught now. 
that's much bigger than omega one, omega three. So we get similar stuff, but now it's omega one dot And this guy Okay, so now we're going to do the same thing. What's the sign of this guy? Negative, right? Because this guy's bigger than this guy. How about the other one? Also negative. So now if we plug those into our eigenvalue equation, what do we get? What's this thing now? Pure real with a positive one and a negative one. So, what do we say about the stability? It's got to be unstable. We got a positive real eigenvalue, right? So, we found that, and we'll do the last one super quick. Similar, similar deal. So, this is now the the big axis. Much with spinning about the big axis where omega one, omega two are tiny. And we're mostly spinning about omega three. So here we get, uh, Okay, so similar deal. What do we got? Negative, right? How about this one? Did I do this right? Oh, I screwed this up. Two, two. Yeah, this should be the other way around. So this is two two three three. This is two two one one. What did I do? One, one, two, two. This is the last one. This is three, three, two, two. This is one, one, three, three. Sorry, guys. Yeah. Okay. Now we got it right. This one's positive. And then we plug this back into our eigenvalue stuff. And we get the pure imaginary thing again. So this is marginal. Okay, so it turns out after all this that the spinning along the maximum and minimum axes of inertia
These are also known as um, major and minor axes. Is passively stable, is, is actually Lyapunov stable. So you get bounded oscillations. Um, spin about the intermediate axis is always unstable. Okay, let's see, what do we do now? Okay, let's do the experiment. I brought the scary modern classic Arnold book. Good book. Okay, so minor axis is the long skinny one, right? Good, right? Major axis is the pancake fat one. Let's try that. Good, right? Intermediate axis is this one, right? In the middle, let's see what happens. What happens? Flips. Flips, right? Let's see. It tumbles and flips, right? Okay, so that's sort of fun. Let's look at some geometry now. So we can look at this sort of these dynamics on the momentum sphere, which is that kind of picture I. So remember the dynamics on uh, in terms of angular momentum are without torque, right? Are just this cross J inverse this. Right? We did this last time. And we can draw this because norm L is conserved. This thing lives on a sphere, right? And we can draw these equilibria and all that stuff on this momentum sphere. I'm going to do. I'll throw this in here. Okay, so this is a plot of the momentum sphere in 3D. The um, equilibria are these green dots. Okay, these, um, these trajectories here, these closed periodic orbits, those are stable bounded oscillations about the minor and major axes, right? And say this is let's say this is the minor axis, major axis, then this one over here is the intermediate axis. And there's a trajectory here that sort of crisscrosses this guy, right? And this thing's a saddle point. So one of these is approaching well, I guess two of them are approaching right along the stable eigenvector, the one that's got the negative real part, and then two of them are leaving, and those are the ones with the positive eigenvector. And locally here, what, what's going to happen right, is you're going to kind of come in and then go away in one of these along one of these other directions. Um, let's see what else is there to say about this. So there's, you can think of this too as these are stable basins of attraction around each of the equilibria, right? So this guy, this whole region over here, and this whole region over here, these are the basins of attraction for these stable points. And then this uh, sort of saddle point trajectory, saddle point trajectories that kind of come and go from the unstable equilibrium point. Does anyone know what those are called? There's a couple of fun, fancy math names for these things. Anyone ever heard of this? Okay, so there's a name for a trajectory. So in particular, right, we have these 
basins of attraction. And these trajectories that go in, that come and go from the saddle point separate the basins of attraction, right? So there's a word for that that's called a separatrix. So these are called separatrices. Has anyone heard that word before? No? Yes, maybe. Okay. Uh, I don't know. It's possible. I don't think so, though, here. I mean, probably there are examples of separatrices in conic sections that, that are somehow related to this, but the idea here in, in dynamical systems, it's a trajectory that sort of rides the boundary between two basins of attraction and separates two different basins of attraction. So you can think about it in like, uh, in like a 1D case, if you had like two potential wells, the separatrix would be the sort of point uh, at the peak between the two wells, right? There it sort of collapses. Here is the momentum sphere. Yep. Yeah, so here, remember, we linearized about here, yeah. and we got this uh, one positive, one negative eigenvector, right? Uh, eigenvalue. So if you look at the eigenvectors, they, there's one, they sort of crisscross here. One of them has a positive eigenvalue, meaning it's leaving, right? One of them has a negative eigenvalue, which means it's approaching. So there's sort of what's what that's telling you is one of these trajectories approaches and another one leaves. Right. And so similarly, so let's say this is the one corresponding to the negative eigenvector. These are approaching, approaching, right, in these, these directions. And then this one's the positive eigenvector, or leaving, leaving, right? Yeah, it seems to be this is non-differentiable about that point in the momentum. What's non-differentiable? Um so differentiable with respect to what? So, so what we're talking about here, right? L dot, we're differentiating with respect to time. And there it is well defined. And the um, derivative with respect to the state here is, is also well defined. Like I, I wrote it down before and I wrote down the A matrix. So it's, um, you have some sort of like, so I guess maybe here's a way to describe it. There, you can think about this also as the limiting case of like two stable periodic orbits coming from like these two directions. This trajectory actually goes like this, right? And then there's a trajectory here that's going like this, right? So they're not actually crisscrossing ever. They sort of hit the same point here, but they're not crisscrossing. So there's no actual like non-differentiability. You have two trajectories that are sort of going like this and going like this. And in the limit, they sort of kiss each other. They just touch. So it turns out they're, they're not really, there's no differentiability issues here, maybe in the sense that you're talking about. Um, there's another word for these. So this is the separatrix thing is this idea that they separate the, the state space into different regions that have qualitatively different behavior. There's another word for this, which is heteroclinic connection. Has anyone heard that word before? Yeah, so what does that mean? Oh, no one's heard of this? Okay, so what this means is heteroclinic Hetero means different, right? Connection, obvious. So what's going on here? Remember, there's another one of these on the other side, right? So these are called heteroclinic connections because they connect the two unstable equilibria. So these trajectories, these red trajectories, if you're on one of them, you're going to go back and forth between the two unstable points kind of forever. That's what that trajectory does. It, it rides from this one to this one and just keeps alternating. Does that make sense? Because for epsilon perturbations, you won't do that, right? So if I'm exactly on it, that's what happens. If I have any epsilon perturbation, I'm in one of these bases of attraction, right? So it's this like super fragile thing that you can't actually do ever in practice, more or less. Does that make sense?
Okay, so that's a bunch of fun dynamical systems theory math and this geometric picture. So this is really kind of like, this is nice and we can visualize this, but this rich kind of geometry pervades sort of dynamics. And uh, this is about the most complicated case, I think that you can still visualize and get some intuition for. But you can see there's like deep connections here for to differential geometry. And like, as you go into higher dimensions, you've got all this kind of stuff with curved surfaces where the dynamics are living, right? And um, there's, there's, all, there's a huge amount of like richness and connection to these differential geometric ideas. It just gets really hard to visualize and think about in higher dimensions. This is about the limit. This book does the general case, if you're curious. It's sort of hardcore, but yeah. Yeah, tricky, tricky thing, right? So what ends up happening there is um, you should plot it and see. But basically, if you have two, it depends on if they're sort of big or small. Essentially, this picture collapses and this sort of flattens out and you end up with no distinct equilibria. Uh, there's no distinct points anymore. You get a continuum of equilibria, right? Does that make sense? Basically, what's going on here is this thing is sort of, um, it turns out that these stable periodic orbits, remember this idea of conservation of, this is conservation of angular momentum gives us the sphere and conservation of kinetic energy gives us this ellipsoid, right? And you can think of these curves as intersections between that ellipsoid and this sphere. Another way of saying that these are level sets of that energy ellipsoid, right? So in the case that you have two of these axes that have exactly the same eigenvalues or, or inertia values, that ellipsoid becomes degenerate. It's no longer a triaxial ellipsoid. It's symmetric in one of these axes. And so now the intersection isn't clean. So these, these points, if you have a, no longer distinct, three distinct axes on that ellipsoid, if it becomes symmetric, you end up now with a curve connecting these guys. So there's not any, there aren't three isolated points anymore. If you have two values that are the same, this turns into a curve, like a great circle arc. Does that make sense? So you have like an equilibrium curve now where any point on that curve can be an equilibrium spin. Um, and yeah, so it turns out now that like you can't think about stability of a point anymore. And this thing isn't really stable in, in uh, it's, it's still Lyapunov stable, it turns out, if it, uh, in general, but it's, it's weirder. Um, and you don't get the same behavior. It's, it's qualitatively different. The other thing to say is that in practice, it's impossible to make a body perfectly symmetric in that way. So in practice, you always have three distinct eigenvalues, even if they're pretty close together, right? Does that make, does that make sense? So what happens if I have all three the same? Sphere, sphere. So everything's in equilibrium point or not, right? And so it turns out in that case, everything's Lyapunov stable. I can spin it about any axis, but I don't get any stiffness like here. If I give it a knock, it'll just stay in that new spot, right? It won't mutate, it won't do anything. Um, oh, I forgot to say, um, this like sort of periodic wobble that, that shows up here, this like simple harmonic oscillator motion, that's called mutation, the wobbling thing that happens, right? I should write that down somewhere. Who's heard of mutation? Has anyone heard the word precession? Is in gyroscopic precession? Okay, so precession's a physics word. These are, um, so you often hear mutation and precession used kind of interchangeably and confused in various ways. They do have different technical meanings, but precession is dumb. <laughs> this is, so precession is a, is a physics word that corresponds to specifically to what this stuff looks like when you use Euler angles. And as everyone knows, Euler angles are evil and bad for you and you should never use them. So we're, not, we're gonna not talk about precession because it's dumb and involves Euler angles, it's bad for you. Mutation is this motion that shows up in Euler's equation and these, these kind of things. So if any physicists tell you about precession, just close, close your ears, ignore them. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so this is then, we're gonna do one fun thing now, really quickly. This is the homework video. 
uh, if I can find it, here we go. So this is, uh, I, I stuck this link in the, in the homework, but we'll watch it. This is the T wrench on the ISS spinning. So what's that flipping motion? Yeah, so this is spinning about the intermediate axis. This is in zero G with you know very little air. So this is like super clean and you can actually get that pretty close to that heteroclinic connection motion, uh, which you see here, right? Pretty sick. So this is, your homework is to reproduce this basically in SIM, right? The second question, you do this. Anyway, that's what's going on. Fun. Any questions about any of this stuff? Yeah. So the, um, the path that it takes between- One of the great challenges uh, in this world- Sorry, is stupid YouTube ad. Okay, go ahead. Uh, the path between the two stable points. Yeah. Looking back and forth. That's the- No. Okay, so to be super clear about this, let me get this big again. So nutation is this small oscillation near a stable point. So these blue guys are nutation, right? So this, this, these blue circles are these stable little oscillations when you're near a, uh, an equilibrium spin, right? That's just this little wobble. That's nutation. This red thing is huge, you know, motion that's like totally flipping around. That is not nutation. That's this unstable flipping behavior, right? Which is a different thing. There's not really a word for that. Um, the, the sort of fancy math word for that red trajectory that connects the two unstable points is heteroclinic connection. So that's like a word for it that's general for any dynamical system where that happens. In the specific case of a spinning rigid body, I don't think there's really a word for that flipping motion. The closest, I guess, word for that is tumbling. Okay, anybody else? Yeah. Well, so if, I mean, if this is an accurate diagram of that video, like if you're at one of these equilibrium, mm -hmm. then like how is some perturbation like sending you along the hydroplane connection to another? Like it feels like any perturbation would just send you along this like stable equilibrium. So, this is an accurate diagram. Yeah, yeah. So, this is a good, um, so in this picture, right, that thing is basically riding the red curve, right? And remember we said the red curve is basically like this limiting case of these stable periodic orbits in one of the basins. Yeah. So what we're really doing there, like in that video, what's really happening, right, is you're basically following a path epsilon close to the red curve that is technically just a really big stable periodic orbit. So it's kind of doing this, right? It's like just riding along this guy and then kind of doing this. That makes sense? So like when you're on one of the unstable equilibrium, there's like a, a non-zero amount of perturbation that'll send you. Yeah, 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 exactly. So the idea is I can't ever stay in an equilibrium spin about that unstable point, no matter how hard I try, right? Okay. So if I like any epsilon perturbation is gonna send me away on this red curve to the other equilibrium point, And then I'm gonna like sort of forever just jump back and forth along that red curve. Does that make sense? That's what's happening in the video, right? Okay, cool. Any other questions about this stuff? This is sort of, oh yeah, and as, as Brian kind of brought up last time, uh, this is this sort of stable spinning phenomena is behind why there's rifling in, you know, for bullets, they get spun on the way out of a gun. So they spin it really fast about the minor axis. So they're in a stable spin, which keeps them pointed in the long skinny direction. So they sort of stay aerodynamic. All their versions of this that are less, you know, evil are, uh, spin stabilized satellites. Um, so early satellites would be spun up like this. So they would stay pointed in the same direction inertially under passive physics and not tumble. There's probably other good examples of this. Uh, anyone else have any good ones? Football, yeah, it's throwing a spiral with a football, minor axis spin, exactly. Yeah, there's a lot of good examples of this in, in like engineered systems and nature and stuff like that. Okay, cool. So this is the end of passive rigid body dynamics. Any other? Cool. All right. So we'll next up, give you some homework hints. So um, numerical simulation. With 3D rotations. So the, the uh, big idea here is if we just naively use 
a runga kata method, either with a rotation matrix or with a quaternion. So who's attempted question two on the homework at this point? Most of you. Okay, so you will see this. I'll just kind of state this without, you'll get into this on the homework. So if I like naively just use a runga kata method, um, what's gonna happen, either a rotation matrix or a quaternion, um, you get numerical drift. So it becomes no longer an orthogonal matrix or no longer a normalized quaternion, right? Um, so we'll say numerical drift off of SO3 manifold, say. So that means Q no longer orthogonal uh, or quaternion no longer unit norm. So you should have seen this in the homework, right? So there's a few standard hacks that people do to fix this. Um, the simplest, dumbest one is if you're using a quaternion, it's pretty easy. You just renormalize the quaternion after every runga kata step, say, right? So this is really easy for quaternions, but kind of expensive for rotation matrices to be doing at every step of your runga kata methods. How do we do this for rotation matrices? Someone said it before. You do an SVD, yeah. So you do an SVD, which gives you an orthogonal matrix times a diagonal matrix times an orthogonal matrix, right? And so turns out the diagonals, if, the, if, if Q were perfectly orthogonal, that diagonal would be all ones, right? Or ones or minus ones. And then, you know, um, life is good. If Q is not perfectly orthogonal, that diagonal matrix will have some values that are not norm one. So to fix it, I just make them all one again and then smush it back together and I get an orthogonal matrix, right? So, but I have to compute an SVD, which is a little bit expensive. I don't wanna be doing that all the time, right? Certainly not every step of my simulator. So this is kind of, um, kind of messy in that case. And the other thing to say about this is this is only possible if I implement my own integrator, right? Cause I have to do this like inside the Runga Kata step more or less. So if I have my own thing with a fixed step Runga Kata method, fine, I can just code this up and it's fine. But if I'm using like differential equations.jl or uh, ODE45 in MATLAB or whatever, I can't really do this, right? Because I, I have to just supply the Q dot function and the integrator just goes. So I can't normalize Q anywhere in there, right, explicitly. So that's sort of a, a possible downside. Okay, so that's easy enough if you're using quaternions. The other one is one that's in the homework, which is called Baumgart stabilization. Who's heard of this before? Not in the homework. Nobody. Okay, interesting. So this shows up actually quite often in, in robotic stuff. We'll do more of it. So there's a general idea, which is to essentially put proportional or PD feedback control on the constraint equation into your dynamics function. Does that make sense? So I have this equation, say in the quaternion case, it's you know Q transpose Q equals one, right? So if I write down the nominal sort of equations, I get this numerical drift that grows over time. A simple dumb hack to fix that is to just put negative feedback on Q transpose Q minus one, right? That's supposed to be zero. I can just stick a proportional controller in the normal dynamics for the that I've put into the integrator that has proportional feedback on that norm error. Super easy to implement. And it turns out that if I do that, um, you can show that now the dynamics are Lyapunov stable. So what will happen with that proportional feedback, unsurprisingly, is instead of the norm just growing unbounded over time, it'll just wiggle around unit norm 
stays bounded. So that's pretty good. It gives you decent long-term behavior. And the plus is you can use standard ODE toolboxes now. So you can just modify the dynamics function and still pass it to ODE 45 or whatever, um, as usual. Simple idea, you can do this for any constraint or any conserved quantity actually. So if you know your system conserves energy, for example, you can do the same thing. Conserves momentum and you want it to have you know, good long-term behavior, you just throw a, a proportional or PD controller on that conserved quantity into the dynamics. Uh, same story here. It's easy to do for the quaternion. It's possible to do it for the rotation matrix, but it's messier and more annoying. Um, makes this uh, makes the the norm Lyapunov stable now. So it doesn't grow huge over time, but it still oscillates about the, the true value. So it's not giving you exact, you know, sort of um, stuff. So you'll, again, this is on the homework, so you should see all this stuff yourselves. Um, so then the, the kind of trade-off here is I can jack the gains up on my proportional or PD controller. And that'll make those oscillations smaller, right? So in theory, I just jack that feedback. In, but why don't I want to do that? No, it doesn't, right? This is orthogonal to the true dynamics, right? The, the nominal ODE actually in continuous time conserves that unit norm. So it's not affecting the true dynamics at all. It's only acting in these directions orthogonal to the true dynamics, right? The true dynamics live on the manifold. So it doesn't actually affect the true dynamics at all. Almost. What does ill conditioning mean? Yeah, so ill conditioning kind of sort of, yeah, you could you could say like the Jacobian might become somewhat ill conditioning in some sense. But the sort of classic story that we were talking about before, we talked about stiff ODEs and stability. Jacking up these PD gains makes the ODE stiff. And it means that your Runge-Kata method is going to have to take tiny, tiny time steps to not blow up again, right? Like we talked about with stiff systems. So this is what limits the efficacy of these methods. You can jack that gain up and make it sort of closer and closer to true conservation. Makes the ODE stiff, makes your Runge-Kata solver have to crank down the step size and take longer to integrate. So, you know, trade off. So uh, what else does there say? Oh, and then, yeah, the big thing here is this can be applied with standard integration toolboxes, right? Unlike the projection idea. Because I'm just modifying f of x, right? So I can, you know, f of x is still fine. Okay, so you guys are going to play with this on the homework uh, a little bit, and you're going to do in particular the next thing, which is the better thing to do. There's a couple of better things. Um, so those are kind of hacks. The better options. There's kind of two better options. The first one is sort of obvious, is to use an implicit integrator where you just explicitly enforce the constraints. And um, in particular, what I mean by that Okay, so remember in the implicit method, we sort of ended up with a root finding problem for the next state that I had to use Newton's method on. 
So if I'm already using Newton's method to solve a root finding problem, I can just stack the implicit equation for the update with the constraint equation and apply Newton's method simultaneously to both sets of equations. Right, so I can set this up to explicitly enforce the constraint at the next time step. So that's sort of an obvious thing. Um, it works. We kind of so you can just apply Newton's method to the constraint equation at time k plus one along with the Runge-Kutta stuff. Um, if you're already doing implicit integration, you know this might not be so bad, but um, in general this is expensive, right? So I'm solving a bigger sort of KKT system with Newton's method. That's sort of expensive. And if I wasn't already doing implicit integration, this makes things a lot more expensive, right? Because I've got to use a Newton solve and stuff. So that's sort of the downside. But if you're already doing implicit integration, this might not be, if you're already doing implicit stuff and you already have other constraints you're dealing with or something, maybe that's not a terrible option. But yeah, sort of downside. Okay, so then the last thing, which is maybe the most, you know, sort of natural thing to do in some sense. Uh, these are called, and this is on the homework, right? This is why we're talking about it. So uh, Runge Kutta, and I don't really know how to say this, but uh, we'll go with Muntha Kass. I think that's roughly how, you, if anyone's actually knows how to pronounce these words, let me know. Um, has anyone heard of these before? Yeah, where'd you hear about them? Yep. Uh, yep. So we'll talk about what it does. So yeah, it, it's in the Julia rigid body dynamics toolbox. They use these. Um, okay. So big idea is if I, um, let's see, how should I do this? Let's look at, so the idea is basically I implement the Runge Kutta step on the Lie algebra, i.e. the axis angles, and then I exponentiate it and multiply on to get the next state. So I, because I use the group multiplication operation, I'm guaranteed to get, because the group's closed under multiplication, I'm guaranteed to get a valid rotation at the next time step. So that's the, the, the basic idea. Let's kind of motivate this um, like, like the following way. So I'll write down a standard, um, oh, let's see, um, let's write that down. So this would be axis angle. Uh, so yeah. That's the basic idea. Um, things to say about this. So this you can basically in a straightforward way, you can do this with any Runge Kutta method. So RK4, explicit, implicit, whatever you want. Basically, you just transform the ODE uh, to be on this Lie algebra, aka you plug in the kinematics of the axis angle and sort of take one step using the axis angle and then take that exponentiate multiply 
Uh, so you can use the same butcher tableaus and all that good stuff as standard rugged cutter methods, and you can make these guys out of any standard one. So that's cool. Um, and yeah, they can be explicit, implicit, all that good stuff. So these are sort of the natural generalization of standard Rangakata methods to we groups, right? Like rotations and SE3 and stuff like that. So let's, we'll do the dumbest one kind of here, which would be an explicit Lee Euler method. So here's kind of how this looks. If I take the standard Euler method, and apply it to the um, rotation kinematics dynamics, right? So omega will look like this. And then the rotation stuff, let's say we'll do rotation matrix, but it looks the same both ways. Um, this would be, you know, QK plus H times Q dot K, which is equal to QK plus H times. Uh, so remember Q dot is Q omega hat, right? Um, and then this thing, I can pull the QK out front and get QK times i plus h omega hat k right okay so if i like so this is strict equality like this is exactly the standard euler step and this thing in general is not going to stay orthogonal right that's the problem what is this guy think back to our discussion about the exponential does anyone recognize this it's, yeah, it's a first order Taylor expansion for the exponential, right? And that makes total sense because that's what Euler integration does, right? According to the Runge Pettis step, it's going to be first order accurate. It's going to give me the first order Taylor expansion of the answer. That's exactly what that is. So let's like kind of, if we recognize that, Specifically, it's the exponential of H omega hat K, right? Okay, so that seems straightforward. So then the, the, the like obvious move here is if I want this to be exactly, uh, uh, you know, on SO3, all I've got to do is replace that first order Taylor expansion with the real exponential applied to the same thing. Then I'm guaranteed to have a real orthogonal rotation matrix. I'm multiplying it on QK, so everything stays orthogonal. I stay on the group, all the good stuff, right? So that's easy enough. Uh -huh. So now what I'm going to get is QK plus one equals QK times matrix exponential of H omega hat K. Or in the quaternion case, I would get QK quaternion multiply quaternion exponential of H times one half omega K. 
right? Because I got the one half and all the quaternion kinematics stuff. Okay, cool. So that's it. So all I got to do is swap the the update for QK plus one with this version that has the exponential in it, and I'm guaranteed to stay on the group. And it's still first order accurate, just like the original one. I can do this for any Runge-Kata method. Essentially, what I'm going to do is um, wherever I'm doing the Runge-Kata step on QK plus one, I'm going to replace it with an exponential of stuff, and that guarantees that I stay on on the manifold. Um, for first and second order methods, it's super trivial, and it's really obvious what to do. For high order methods, it gets a little messier, but it's it's still actually pretty straightforward to do. Uh, the derivations are just messier. Yeah. Oh yeah, sorry, my bad. Thank you. Yes. Okay, cool. Any questions about this? Okay, awesome. And I'm totally lost it. Yeah. Well, guaranteed to Stanley group. Um, so let's see the derivation gets messier for orders higher than two. But still kind of fairly straightforward. Um, and you can look up the sort of explicit equations for um yep uh, so that uh, that that the Euler step the uh, rotation that only like you don't need to leave your up to be like numerical accuracy or whatever like how you're keeping it yes and that's right exponentially so does that eventually ever come yeah yeah so totally right um if you use double precision it's gonna stay on to double precision you'll get round off accumulation but it's going to basically like, you know, that's, that's going to accumulate really, really slow. Right. And so you can, you can simulate for a long, long time um, in double precision like this, and, and it will stay really small. Whereas the, the naive Euler method, it's going to kind of blow up on you really quickly. Right. Like you can do this other thing for like in simulation terms, you can simulate for like months, years, that kind of thing with, with this and still stay pretty, pretty good. Depends on the system, blah, blah, blah. But that's growing with the number of steps you take due to like round off and stuff. Because this other stuff is growing kind of, um, yeah, I don't know. That, that's kind of, yes, you're absolutely right. But this is much better than the, the other thing. And it's, it's kind of sort of like, you kind of can't avoid some of that stuff, right? It's just the fact of life of dealing with floating point numbers. Yeah. The higher order runga kind of methods higher order RKMK. So we did first order here. You're going to do second order on the homework. Doing third, fourth order. So like if you want the fourth order classic RKMK that uses the same butcher tableau as the standard, you know, famous fourth order run to cut it, it's a little bit messy to do that derivation. It gets more complicated, but you can still do it. It's still pretty straight. Sort of, kind, not exactly. So the, it, it gets tricky to verify the order conditions. So remember the order conditions for Runga Kata, we have to like do this big Taylor expansion. We didn't even do that for RK4, right? Because it gets messy. Turns out here, you have to do those order conditions on the lead algebra, which is even messier than for standard Runga Kata methods. But it turns out you can show that they still hold if you do this with any standard Runga Kata butcher tableau and essentially exponentiate at the end. There's some messy details, it gets kind of gross, 
I'm not going to do it because it's, it's going to take me like multiple lectures to kind of go through all that math. And I don't think it's worth it. You can look it up if you need it. But yeah, that's it. basically checking the order conditions and, and deriving the, the stuff here is much nastier. Past order two. Yeah. Is that a, a special operator between the lowercase q here? Or is that just lowercase q? Oh, this is quaternion multiplication. Okay. Yeah. Is there a special example? So uh, we're going to use here those L and R matrices. That's what we're going to do. So if you use that L matrix for left multiply, it's going to be um, explicitly right in our sort of matrix notation. It's L of QK uh, quaternion exponential, which we're going to write like this. Um, equivalently, right, H over two. Like this. So in code, that's how I would do it. So you're going to implement this quaternion exponential function, and you're going to use this left quaternion multiplied matrix. It's a four by four matrix, right, that we defined last time. So that's how you want to do it. You could also implement like a, an explicit like multiplication operator. And if you're using a language that has op operator overloading, which Julia does, you can define this. You know, re you can overload the the times operator on quaternion. On a quaternion struct or class, you know, and define this. And some languages you can do that. And in Julia, you can actually do this. And there's a rotations.jl package that does it. But I want you guys to kind of do it because a lot of languages don't have that. And it's kind of better to be a little more explicit about it. And also, this makes it easier to like take derivatives and stuff. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. My bad. And this thing, right, is also you can use that H matrix we defined last time to do to do this from the three D vector. Okay, thanks. Anybody else? Okay, cool. So, what are we doing on time? So we have like three minutes. The next topic is like a distinct kind of break from this. Um, so I think maybe we'll just save that for next time. I got the time right. All right. So yeah, we'll, so next time we'll talk about Newton Euler stuff and SE3 stuff, and then we'll do um, quad rotors and flying things and some more examples. And um, you should be all good for this homework. If anyone has any questions, I'll hang out for a bit. Um,